Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. This is going to be a great episode with Jonah Stewart of Jonah's Alaskan Outfitters out of Wasilla, Alaska. And we're going to dive into Jonah's doll sheep hunts, his brown bear hunts, and grizzly bear hunts there in Alaska. It's going to be a great episode. Before we get to that, I want to thank you guys, the listeners, for your avid support of this podcast. I appreciate all of the emails and direct messages on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you haven't sent me an email, feel free to do so. If you have a question or comment, you can do that at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. I want to thank the sponsors of this podcast. Go Hunt Insider has been the title sponsor of this podcast from the beginning. And Lorenzo Sartini and his crew do such a great job over at GoHunt.com and over at the Insider there at GoHunt. And you can use the J. Scott promo code when signing up for the GoHunt Insider. And you can get a $50 Kuyu gift card just for signing up. Now, the GoHunt Insider is the inside way to look at all of the draw odds, figure out all of the hidden gem hunts, research units, Uh, all across the Western U.S., and uh, I get emails from listeners every single day at how much they enjoy uh, using the resource there at the Gohan Insider. So I want to thank Lorenzo and his crew. I also want to thank Jason Harrison with Kuyu, uh, kuyu kuyu.com, and I want to make sure you guys remember that there is a 2017 Kuyu World Tour and there's 26 locations starting out in Dixon, California on May 20th uh, at their garage sale. They're going to be then headed to Oregon, Washington, Montana, Idaho, uh, back through Montana, Colorado, Nebraska, Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, through Grand Junction, Colorado, back through Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, Nevada, Arizona, California, and um, make sure to stop in at the Kuyu World Tour. You'll be able to try on all of the uh, Kuyu gear. They'll have uh, all sizes and, and uh, it's a perfect way if you've never had your hands on the Kuyu gear to see it in person. They're going to have uh, exclusive Kuyu giveaways. Uh, they're going to have special guests at each stop, uh, expert clinics. There'll be special deals and discounts on the World Tour. And uh, it's just going to be a great uh, uh, showcase for Kuyu. I want to thank Jason Harrison and his crew. Uh, also, Cheston Davis, phonescope.com. They're out of Beaver, Utah. Uh, make sure to use the JScott16 promo code, and you're going to get a 10% discount at phonescope.com. Uh, also, uh, Cody Nelson and the Outdoorsmen, they're the Optics Authority in Phoenix. Use the J. Scott promo code. You're going to get 10% discount at the Outdoorsman's products there. Uh, so, guys, let's get right into this episode uh, with Jonah Stewart. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today, we have Jonah Stewart of Jonah's Alaskan Outfitters out of Wasilla, Alaska. Jonah is an accomplished hunter himself. He's in the pursuit of the North American Archery 29, the Super Slam. He's currently got 18 species of the 29 under his belt, and uh, Jonah guides primarily for doll sheep uh, in the Brooks Range and brown bear in South Central Alaska. Jonah, how you doing? I'm doing good. Jay, how are you? Oh, just fine. I'm excited to uh, get you here on the podcast. Uh, I know that uh, you're probably about to get real busy uh, with your brown bear hunts, and uh, certainly this summer with your... uh, doll sheep hunts and so I wanted to get you before before you really got uh, lighting your hair on fire and getting busy so it's going to be fun to talk to you. Uh, Jonah uh, why don't you give me and the listeners a little breakdown on um, where where you grew up and uh, your start in hunting and, and the outdoors and kind of how it led you to Wasilla Alaska and what you're doing now. Well, I uh, I was born in Missoula, Montana. We moved to Alaska when I was six years old, and I've pretty much lived up here ever since. I started hunting. My birthday was opening day antelope season in Montana, and my dad took me on my first antelope hunt when I was three years old, and I still remember that. And kind of since then, I just it's a, all that's really come across my mind every day of my life. <laughs> It's just going hunting and being in the outdoors. That's um, awesome. I knew, 
I knew from the time I was a little kid that I wanted to be a guide and be a pilot in Alaska. Um, that's just the ultimate freedom is the, only, the best way that I can put it. Um, and here I am, 32 years old. Uh, yeah, just running an outfit and business. And when I'm not guiding, spending time with my family and traveling around hunting. That's awesome. Um, so moving to Alaska at six years old, did you move to Wasilla where you're at now? We did. Yeah. Uh, about 10 miles from where I live now. Um, so pretty much grew up up here. And uh, I did the, spend a little bit of time. I, I went to college in Colorado, uh, wrestling. And where at? I, uh, Gunnison. Oh, you did. So you went to, is it Western yeah. Colorado? I did. Yeah. Nice. Um, so you spent some time there around Gunnison and, and so you were a college wrestler. I was, yeah. Were you able to hunt at all yeah. in Colorado? Um, those, those years that you were wrestling in Gunnison. Oh yeah. I hunted a lot. Um, and that, that kind of got me started on my out of state hunts and, uh, I basically went from that. I started guiding down there and in Alaska. Just in my early twenties, I guided in four or five, six states a year, and and uh, hunted anywhere I could get a tag in between. That's awesome. Uh, as much hunting as you've done, uh, do you also fish, or do you have time for fishing, or have a love or passion for fishing at all? Um. I love to fish when the fishing's good. <laughs> so you, you love to catch, <laughs> is what you're saying. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I grew up in Alaska and got pretty spoiled um, yeah. salmon fishing. So it, I, w I wouldn't say I'm a diehard fisherman by any means, but I, I catch a lot of fish throughout the year. For sure. Jonah, Wasilla, Alaska obviously has become really well known obviously because of Sarah Palin being you know from Alaska and from Wasilla um, but for the listeners that don't know where is Wasilla Alaska located within within the state uh, Wasilla is right in south central Alaska it's about 40 miles north of Anchorage okay and uh, you primarily guide for doll sheep in the Brooks range and then brown bear in south central Alaska would you say your business is made up, say, 50-50 in both of those animals, or is there more of a focus in your business on one or the other? Uh, about 50-50. Okay. And are the hunts that you do, let's, let's talk about the hunts that you do, are they uh, all subject to the draw through the Alaskan state system, or are they strictly all over the counter? In other words, if someone wants to hunt with you, can they just... Um, call you up and and um, set up a hunt and and you know book it for next year. Now currently you can just call and book a hunt. Uh, none of the areas that I'm currently guiding in are a draw for any species. Um, I've tried to stay away from the draw hunts just <laughs> just so if guys want to want to come hunting they know that they can come for sure. Um, what's going on with the Brooks Range with the doll sheep? Um, I heard that there was potential some some winter kill, or you know, uh, a few years ago, some winter kill. Uh, there definitely was. Uh, saying that the Brooks Range winter killed would be kind of like saying um, Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, and Arizona winter killed. <laughs> in fact, the Brooks Range is probably bigger than all of that. Okay, uh, that puts it in perspective. So that's that's not a very fair statement. Um, some of the stuff on the north side of the Brooks Range got hammered three or four years ago and actually got hammered a couple of years in a row. Um, and they're still struggling up there. Uh, where I hunt is the south central Brooks Range. It's got a little more brush, a uh, little bit better winter habitat for sheep. And we've, we've been doing very well the last couple of years. Uh, Tell, tell me about your doll sheep hunts. Uh, 
uh, there that you do? I mean, are, do you fly in? Um, kind of walk me through a from beginning to end process of how those hunts work. Okay. Uh, so I go up the 1st of August. Uh, some of my guides drive my trucks trailers up to the Brooks Range with fuel and camp and all the equipment. I fly my airplane up. Um, spend about 10 days doing a sheep survey. Just I fly every guide you or every drainage in all my guide use areas, uh, and do my own survey, use lambs, rams, and number of legal rams, just so I know from year to year basis exactly what's happening, uh, where I hunt and have a, some, a number to base how many hunters I'm going to take for the following year off of what I'm seeing. Uh, my hunters will fly into Fairbanks and then they'll fly to Coldfoot. We'll go down and pick you up in Coldfoot in a truck, drive 50 miles north of there to a base camp, you know, meet your guide, go through equipment. Um, everybody likes to hunt a little bit differently, so I like hunters to meet their guide before they're in the field, make sure everybody gets along good, um, go through food together, go, you know, look at tents, and basically talk about how they want to you know, do their hunt. Uh, we'll do paperwork, license tags, hunt records right there in that camp. And then I load you up in a super cub and fly you home, drop you off. And it's a backpack hunt from there. Uh, we use Delorme in reaches. They're pretty awesome nowadays. Uh, I can see exactly where my guides are at. They can tell me if they need airdrops for food or, or, Hey, you know, if we haven't seen anything good in a few days, pick me up here and we'll go somewhere else. Um, but they are no base camps. Once you're in the field, uh, they're just a, just a backpack, real sheep hunt. Do you do all of the, the, um, flying in your plane, dropping people off? I mean, are you, are you primarily the one that's doing all of the flying? I am. Yeah. I, uh, I actually, I've guided lots and lots of sheep hunters, and actually about three years ago, I had a client tell me, he said, man, no matter how good of a guide you are, you, you really should be the one just, just flying and just running the business, because there's a lot, lot that goes into Alaska between weather and, and uh, yeah, pretty much anymore, I'm I'm just a outfitter and pilot how long have you been flying jonah uh say eight years i believe nice tell me about your plane i have uh two pa18 piper super cubs uh just basically set up with big tundra tires um and some of the alaska modifications for flying in the bush they're a two-seater we're playing the pilot and the passenger, and best short field performance airplanes in the world. So, how, how much distance do you need on the ground? Obviously, it, it, it depends on elevation, I would assume. But roughly, how how much do you need to land, and how much do you need to take off? Uh, about three hundred feet. Wow. So you fly in, you fly, once they get their ram, then you you have pickup points and you fly the guys out as well? Yep. And you talked about your surveys. This is something that's interesting to me. In, in you know, generalizations, what type of numbers are you seeing and when, when you fly your surveys? Is it, is it a, you know, consistent number? Is it growing? Is it, is it going down? What's kind of the, the, the common theme that you're noticing? Um, about three years ago, uh, we did have, had when the two bad winters hit in a row, we had kind of a low land to U ratio, but then the following year was a fantastic winter. Um, and a lot of the lambs actually had twins and it kind of made up for it. It's a pretty overall population is pretty close every year. Um, actually the last two years, uh, I've seen the most legal rams that I've seen in, uh, since 2010. So it's been looking really good. Uh, and I expect it to 
be that way for the next few years. That's fantastic. Um, and what are the what are the rules in Alaska as far as when you fly in, you have to wait, what is it, 24 hours before you can start hunting? Is that correct? Uh, 3 a.m. the following day. Okay. So uh, my hunters that start on August 10th, I will typically fly them in on the 8th. Um, you know, it's 24 hours of daylight, and they can really start basically hunting at midnight of the you know morning of the 10th and um, is it literally light for 24 hours or is there a couple hour period where it's is it almost like uh, you know gray light first thing in the morning and you know normal you know say lower 48 like as far as lighting um <laughs> if it's clear out the first five, six days of sheep season, it's 24 hours. I mean, it's light. Uh, the sun's not necessarily up, but it's plenty light to shoot at midnight. If it's overcast, it'll be oh, probably too dark to shoot for a couple hour period there. But by about the 15th of August, uh, we definitely start losing daylight. Um, and it, it changes fast that time of year. I mean, it is summer, 10th of August is summertime, and the 1st of September, a lot of times snow is hitting. For sure. So it, it changes fast. Uh, on your doll sheep hunts, um, what do you normally tell guys as far as, you know, if they're in good shape and can get around and move, um, you know, how many sheep normally do they see a day? You know, how many rams, how many, how many legal rams, kind of what's the scoop on on the density or the amount that that you see uh the area that i hunt's a real high density of sheep um the last two years i think last year my hunters averaged seeing five legal rams during their hunts um you know each each person which is pretty good um i typically tell guys you're going to see you know between one and five legal rams um throughout the course of your hunt you know, we might see as many as 50 to 70 rams in a in a week of hunting in some of the better areas. And um, most most everywhere you see lots of sheep daily. Um, I, I do have a couple areas that are a little bit lower density. And, uh, it it does seem like the areas with lower density sheep are where some of the biggest rams live. But uh, most of the places, guys like to see sheep and like sure like hunting where the population's good. So how how long how many day hunts do you do for doll sheep? It's eight days of hunting. Uh, you will typically be in the field if you stay the whole time for about ten days. Uh, sometimes eleven on the first hunt they fly in on the eighth but it's eight actual days of hunting and those doll sheep hunts um are there un other animals that you're seeing that inhabit the same country at the same time grizzly bears uh, most everybody sees at least one bear on their hunt uh about 50 percent of my hunters will buy grizzly bear tags and i do that on a trophy fee so if you shoot one and then it's a trophy fee um but okay pretty consistently see bears and to be a legal ram in alaska what does that entail uh it has to be full curl so 360 degree uh circle eight years old or broomed on both sides broken off on both sides Okay. I'm looking at your um, Facebook page. You got some really good, really good photos here. Uh, do most people come? Do they choose to use a rifle for the doll sheep, or um, do you have quite a bit of bow hunters? And is your preference to take rifle hunters, or do you care? Um, I typically only take one or two bow hunters a year. 
Uh, not all areas are very conducive for bow hunting. So the, the bulk of my hunters are rifle hunters for sheep. Um, and then I have a, a few spots that are, are very conducive for bow hunting. And uh, most years I, I take one or two bow hunters. Uh, last year, everybody was, everybody rifle hunted. But How many doll sheep um, hunters typically do you take in a year? I mean, is there a set number and then you're booked or, or, you know, can you, what, what can you accommodate? There isn't a set number. I, I kind of base my sheep numbers off two things. First, uh, what I see in the, basically the population in my survey the prior year. Um, and what I'm looking for is mature rams. Um, and second, knowing who I have coming back for guides. Um, right now I got an awesome team of guides, more guides than I need, but, but they're all awesome. Um, and I take between six and 10 hunters a year okay. for sheep. And that the season runs, you said from August 10th to what? September 1st. It runs to September 20th. I personally don't push any of my sheep hunts into September. Um, from my experience in the Brooks range, about every third year you get snowed out hmm. in September. Mm -hmm. And I, I end my sheep hunts August 26th. And that's just not that it's not good sheep hunting after that, but you risk losing too many days to weather. Sure. Um, I'm looking at these photos and looking at the country. So when you drop off your sheep hunters, um, are they sometimes right, like right where they need to be as far as right on sheep? Um, or do most all of them have pretty, you know, physical and, and um, you know, pretty good hikes to get to where they need to go for where the sheep are? Uh, it's about 50, 50. I, I do land on a lot of ridges. Um, I had three or four guys shoot rams right from their tents, um, you know, on ridges basically where I have dropped them off and set up camp. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a sheep pond. I definitely don't tell anybody that it's going to be easy. You're on a, <laughs> on a real hunt, a backpack hunt, but. I, that being said, I do do land on a lot of ridges, and that's where the sheep live. So, for sure, but, uh, I, it looks like a lot of um, sc a scree rock and, and a lot of just typical doll sheep type country. Um, you know, are most guys able to handle? You know, and and are most do, do most guys show up prepared and are able to handle the terrain? Or do you find that, you know, half the guys that show up really have not trained near hard enough? Um, I would say most of the hunters I take uh, have trained and, and can handle it. It's it's as mild a sheep country as I've found anywhere in Alaska. But that being said, it's still sheep country. Um <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's it's mild country by by sheep hunting standards for whatever that's worth. For sure. So yeah. you're you you do a lot of landing up on the ridges. In other words, you're gaining the hunters some elevation, whereas there's other other doll sheep hunts that say you have to really walk through the drainages, you know, fight in the brush and what have you. Is one of the reasons that you like to land up higher on the ridges is to get give that elevation gain for, for your guides and your hunters? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's exactly why I land up high. Uh, just try to make it as easy as I can for guys. It's, if you're waking up in sheep country, it's a lot easier for somebody that doesn't do that all the time to keep a good, good attitude. And when you wake up and there's sheep, you know, pick out your tent and you're looking at sheep every day right there. Um, yeah, it's good stuff. More enjoyable and, and easier for clients. Do the grizzly bears um, 
do they typically stay in the valleys and and more down in the brush or do they go every bit as high, you know go right where the, the the sheep are as well oh they go right where the sheep are at um the bears will typically stay high until it freezes and and kills the berries it's different every year some years if we have a really good berry crop uh i mean i've had years where every one of my sheep hunters killed grizzly bears and the reason for that is two things one they all bought tags and two um just a real good berry year so you're seeing seeing bears daily um if we get an early frost in july and it kills the berry crop then then we won't kill as many bears that year because they'll we'll be up high sheep hunting and bears will be down cruising the river bottoms gotcha so that august 10th start date through the 26th that 16 day window typically year in and year out um what kind of temperatures do your sheep hunters experience just in you know maybe give me the normal and then give me obviously what it could range either on the high or the low uh, typically on the first hunt, just because the days are so long, um, we're seeing days into the 60s, sometimes hotter, and not very many nights that are freezing. Um, but by the end of the second hunt, a lot of nights are freezing. So if you're if we're hunting to the 24th, 25th, 26th of August, um, man, we can be getting snow in some of the higher spots and and freezing temps at night, but still most days are hitting 50 or so. Okay. Let's talk, um, let's talk about gear, um, and what you recommend guys wearing. So it's, it's eight days of hunting. So kind of go through the gear and talk about maybe how much gear to bring, um, you know, from, from socks to boots to pants to, you know, long underwear, no long underwear, uh, you know, rain gear. If you could go through kind of a gear list for a typical, you know, eight-day hunt with, with yourself, with your outfit. Okay. Um, personally, what my layering system, what I, I like to wear, uh, I wear in a, for pants, I wear an attack pant made by QU. Um, I'll carry the ultramarino, the, their lightest weight zip-off bottoms, and then a pair of the Peloton 200 zip-off bottoms. And for me, that's enough of a layering system on the bottom. I don't carry any extra clothes other than that. Um, and top, I'll wear a QU Merino shirt. I love the Peloton 200 hoodie. Uh, it's basically, it's not windproof, but it's, it's warm, um, and that's what I'll hike in and kind of my go-to. And then for a coat, I wear a QU either 240 hoodie, which is a windproof hoodie, uh, or the guide jacket. And then I carry a keen eye hooded coat. Also, all that stuff's made by a QU. Um, and then the two guess rain gear, uh, top and bottom. And that's my go-to layering system for any hunt anywhere I go, whether I'm cruiser hunting in Mexico or sheep hunting in the Brooks Range. Um, unless it's a super cold weather hunt, then I'll have a, some cold weather gear. That That is my layering system. Most of my sheep hunting guides wear a little bit different layering system. They wear uh, the... Uh, <laughs> I'm having a... Can't remember exactly what they're wearing. They're, oh, the Yukon. They're wearing a Yukon coat and pant because it's waterproof, and that is their only pant that they hunt in. Um, and then they so most Jonah, of them they're super down. So, in other words, they're wearing out of Kuyu makes three types of rain gear. They make the Ultra, they make the Chugach, which is what you wear, but they're wearing the Yukon, which is the heaviest duty of the rain gear. And they wear that as just their, that's all they wear as a pant. They don't even wear an attack pant. That's their, no, that is their only pant. And um, almost all my guides, that's their, I haven't tried it personally, um, but that is their go-to. That's all they sheep hunt in. Same pair of pants the whole fall. Um, 
And so and then will, they wear, layering will for... they wear long, uh, the Zip-Off long, QU long underwear underneath that, and then they'll just wear that as their pant, and that's what they wear, whether it's sunny or rainy or whatever? They typically don't even wear long underwear. Um, most of them take long underwear, and they take a pair of the uh, super down pants mm -hmm. for when you stop on a ridge. You know, you drop your pants down, zip on your super down pants, and lay there glassing all day, warm, dry. Um, and it, I haven't personally hunted in it, but there must be something to it because that's what all my goods. Do you think they're picking? Where now? Do you think they're um, picking the Yukon from a functionality standpoint because it's a, it's heavier duty and they're guiding in it all year, um, all season long, and they're gonna they're they're choosing to have a function of you know durability with the heaviest duty Kuyu rain gear as opposed to the middle you know the Chugach which you know what you would wear is that is that your idea that that that's why they like that you think? It is, and so that they have waterproof clothes on all the time um, and not having to carry rain gear. Um, the, the Yukon stuff is definitely thicker and tougher, so just for wearing as an everyday pant, uh, it would, it's a better choice. Um, how, how many um, pairs of socks do you recommend uh, hunters wear on an eight-day hunt uh, and and also, do your guides follow suit, or do they do they do it a little bit differently on the socks? Everybody's a little bit different when it comes to feet. Me personally, I wear a pair of socks, and I take one extra pair of socks. Do you, um, do you rotate them, or do you I wear do. for three or four days and then switch them out and wear the other pair, or do you rotate each day? I never even take the extra pair out of my pack. <laughs> uh, I, I, just, I wear the same pair of socks the whole time. Okay. Uh, I don't change any clothes on a backpack hunt. Um, so in other words, you take an personal. you take an extra pair, but the reality is, at the end of the trip, almost every time the the pair is still just ha just as you left it when you when you packed it. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Um, I now, but everybody's feet are different, so I, I don't recommend that necessarily to hunters. Um, I, I wouldn't take any extra clothes on a backpack hunt. I'd take your layering system, uh, and I would take a few pairs of socks if you think you need more than more than one pair of socks. Um, I don't. Most of my guides don't. But okay, what type of boots, Jonah? Do you do you do you personally run and what do you, what do you recommend to hunters and what do your guides typically wear? That's kind of a hard question. Everybody's feet are different. Uh, I wear a Scarpa Omega, which is a plastic boot on all my mountain hunts. That's, that is my go-to sheep and goat hunting boot. Uh, most people don't like plastics. Um, some of the more common boots, guys, my guides tend to lean towards a mountaineering boot. Um, Scarpa is probably the most common one uh, that most of my guides are wearing. Canatrex, Michael boots, Amberlin, um, Mendel's. I mean, there's a, there's a dozen good boot companies. Um, I currently, when I'm running a leather boot, if I'm moose hunting or or somewhere that's not quite as rough, I, I'm running a Zamberlin Outfitter, and they they seem to be a pretty good boot. Okay. I've only had them for a year or so, but. Um, what about gaiters? Um, do you wear gaiters on all your hunts, or do you just wear your rain pants and call it good? I don't wear gaiters very often unless there's snow on the ground. Um, most all my guides do. They wear the Yukon gaiter. Um, and, and I wear them if there's snow. But my feet tend to get really hot. And if when I wear a gaiter, um, they get hotter. So I, I tend to steer away from them. 
Okay. Uh, so let me think about this. So as far as we've covered boots, we've covered socks, we've covered what you wear for pants, uh, long underwear, rain gear. You've talked about your jacket. Um, what about us? Do you do you wear a ball cap or do you wear a beanie? Do you wear both? What do you like? Um, I wear a ball cap most of the time, uh, and then I always carry a beanie and a neck gaiter. Okay. What about gloves? Um, for, for me personally, I, I don't wear gloves most of the time. I always carry a pair of the Peloton, two Peloton gloves or two Marina real lightweight gloves. And then I carry one pair of either uh, mittens or I get a pair of the North Star Q gloves that are pretty awesome too. And that's more just for sitting on a hill and glassing. Um, I don't usually wear wear a glove when I'm hiking, personally. Um, Do you feel like if you're moving, your your blood's moving, you're moving, you don't need... You must run pretty warm. Uh, you must run pretty warm. I do, yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, and I like staying cool when I'm hiking. So I, I don't wear a hat. I don't wear gloves. I don't wear long underwear, typically in a T-shirt. Um, that's me personally. As soon as I stop, I put that stuff on so that you're not getting cold. But I I get pretty warm, personally. Okay, and back to one other thing. You said you wear the merino, the lightest weight merino um, shirt, uh, long sleeve, I would assume. And do you wear the zip tee as well that zips um, so you can ventilate? I do most of the time, yeah. Um, I got a whole pile of the merino shirts and all the different weights, um, zip, the true nut zip one. just kind of depends on the day and what I'm hiking with, but I tend to lean towards the lightest merino shirt with the with the zip neck. Sure. Um, and and you, you're saying you wear that basically on an eight-day hunt, you'll wear that shirt the whole time and one of the benefits of merino is you know from a from a physical stand or from a you know human odor standpoint it's it's amazing how you can wear those and and those shirts really don't stink yep it is um i i I couldn't wear anything but merino anymore um just for that reason okay uh, what, what guns do you recommend? What caliber, um, you know, what, what do you recommend guys bring on that doll sheep hunt? Um, may, whatever you're comfortable with is fine for a sheep hunt. Um, 270, 30 odd six, a lot of the 300 calibers are, tend to be what guys are showing up with, with custom guns, just cause they're, you know, kind of a flat shooting, do everything. Um, sheep die pretty easy, so it doesn't doesn't really matter. But lot uh, a sh- lot of the shots tend to be on the longer end, 200, 250 yards. And I've had guys shoot sheep out to 600 yards. Um, that all kind of depends on the hunter and and what what he wants. But just a good flat shooting gun that you're comfortable with. Um, bear hunting is a little different. You know, bear hunting, it's nice to have a 300 caliber or bigger. Uh, sure. 375. How On a doll sheep hunt, how, how many shells do you typically recommend a hunter carry? I would say bring two boxes to camp. Uh, we shoot rifles before I fly in, make sure everybody's good to go, but uh, probably a box of shells on on your hunt. Um, some guys after watching him shoot in camp, I recommend bringing more, but <laughs> <laughs> have an ammo drop from the plane. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Are, are your doll sheep there? Are they, uh, fairly tolerant as far as, or are they very, very spooky? No, they're, if they see you, then they're spooky. 
If they smell you, then they're spooky. Noises don't seem to bother them too much. Um, they're any of the animals in Alaska. Um, I'm trying to think of a good way to put it. Most animals in Alaska are not near as spooky as, say, an elk or a whitetail or a mule deer or a kuzma. Um, it's it's just different. Alaska is hunting different. You have a whole new set of challenges. Um, but no, sheep aren't, sheep aren't very spooky. Aren't super spooky. They're not not an incredibly tough animal to hunt. It just physically, mentally is exhausting. And and uh, you know, then finding finding full curl legal legal rams, you might have to look through a lot of sheep. Um, you know, on average, two to four percent of the sheep population makes it to full curl. So, you know, it ends up being a legal full curl ram. So that means, you know, for every twenty-five to fifty sheep you see, one of them is going to be legal. Sure. And that 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 makes it mentally tough for people. You know, we looked at twenty rams today. What? Why wasn't one legal? Well, it, uh, it's a numbers game. <laughs> yeah just gotta keep going and and is that a is that an age thing like are there a bunch of rams that say are are is there a ton of young rams out there or are there just rams that never will make full curl um well there are a lot of rams that will never make full curl but they will be eight and we do actually have a lot of sheep that broom in the brook thing um yeah once they hit eight years old, they just kind of their odds of surviving the winters go way down. Um, but no, we it seems like every year you see tons and tons of the four to seven year old rams, and that's just they're in their prime, they're healthy, they're they got good teeth. Um, and then once they start hitting that eight, nine, ten years old, they just start fading out, go downhill. It's, yeah, it's a hard life on the mountain. On that doll sheep hunt, the 10th through the 26th, um, what are the bugs like as far as mosquitoes? Are, are they are they real bad, or is it typically frosted by then and they're not bad, or what what's the story with that? Most years, they're not too bad. Uh, on the south side of the Brooks Range, some of the hunts on the north side of the Brooks Range, the bugs are unbelievably terrible. Um, south side, it's not too bad. It's It will typically be a little fly not so much mosquitoes but if if we have anything it'll typically be little biting flies do, do you yeah. recommend guys bring any bug spray or do they wear a face mask or or anything like that or what you just tell them to tough it out most of the time it's not needed i uh, always have lots of little sticks i typically on the early season hunt will carry a, a little stick of bug spray um trying to can't remember who made it um so in other words it's not a a spray but it's almost like a chapstick yeah that's basically what it looks like it's about three times the size and diameter of a chapstick and about the same length um they work really well or you know a little tiny one ounce bottle of deet um what do what do most like of that. your hunters' packs come in weighing, and what would say your guides pack weigh at the start of a trip? Oh, on average, probably about fifty pounds. Um, and <sighs> it's hard to tell. It's hard until you do a backpack hunt to realize all the things that you can live without. Um, after the first couple of days, you realize all the things you don't need, but not including a gun. Most hunters packs should come in at around 40 to 45 pounds, uh, without water. Um, or maybe, a you know, with a little water bottle, uh, guides packs are going to be 60, 70 starting out on the hunt on average. Speak, um, speaking of water, my, go ahead, Jonah. Sorry. My hunts tend to not be too bad because um, I do airdrops. 
So a lot of it, I will typically have my guides pack a week's worth of food, leave half of that food where I drop you off um, in a food cache, take three days' worth of food, and then uh, my guides will make airdrops before they leave on the hunt, put their names on them. And that way they don't, you don't want to totally rely on your pilot in case bad weather or something happens. You always want to make sure you're prepared and have enough food for your whole hunt. Um, but you don't necessarily need to carry it with you the whole time. It just needs to be somewhere where you can get back to it. Um, and then I, I do airdrops. So that allows us to keep pack weights down quite a bit. Um, there's a big difference between carrying three days worth of food and 10. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. That That's a huge deal to be able to do those airdrops. Um, I was going to ask you about uh, the tents. Uh, what do you recommend for, for tents and structures? Um, y- you know, the, you see these um, uh, floorless shelters and you know, these tarp tents and some of that. I'm just curious on, on, you know, would you say never bring those or would you say always bring it? You know, tell me what you're doing with the tents. Which ones do you like? Um well, I have about 20 different backpacking tents, um, so guys don't need to bring a tent. Um, I would, I personally love a floorless tent. I carry a Golight Shangri-La 3. That's what I've used for the last 10 years. Um, it'll allow two guys to crawl in with their backpacks and crawl in with all your gear, cook inside it, um, everything, and then I stick my sleeping bag in uh, a super lightweight bivy sack and just leave it unzipped, just so the bottom doesn't get wet if you slide off your pack. Um, none of my guides will use those. They hate them. They think it's the dumbest thing <laughs> ever. <laughs> what do they use? Uh, typically, um, either a QU Mountain Star two-person tent or uh, Big Agnes Copper Spur 2. And they're they're a real similar. It's basically the same footprint on either tent. Uh, he's probably a little tougher. Um, and the poles are on the outside versus the Copper Spur. The poles are between the fly and the, and the mesh fabric. But basically what that allows is it has a vestibule on each side. So you're not climbing over each other to get in and out of your tent. You each have this vestibule to put your uh, pack underneath. Uh, any tent that you're crawling in from the head of it, if you're wet, your stinky socks are going over your pillow, and um, nobody ever takes them. They they just they're not a good enough design, especially for two people. Um, so I. That that seems to be what everybody likes the best. Um, do you and I have? Do your hunters um, ever take um, their own tent and and the guide takes? Say it. Say if I came, would it be like if I wanted to bring my own Kuyu Mountain Star two person and the guide wanted to bring? Would you be like that? Is just crazy. You know, two people should sleep in the tent, or can can each person have their own tent? Oh, each person can absolutely have their own tent. Um, what, what's normal? Depends on the guide and the hunter. Um, <laughs> I, I basically let, I mean, that's why I think it's important as long as you have good guides that you know you can trust. And as long as my hunters are happy and my guides are doing a good job, I'm not going to tell them how they need to hunt. I'm going to put them in the best spot they can be, and I'm going to provide them with the best equipment and food that I can come up with and I can find. Um, I'm going to let them hunt and camp how they want to. And it's, you know, a lot of different on every hunt. So you, know, you got a couple hours when client shows up for their hunt where you're meeting your guide, you're talking about tents, you know, Hey, I don't want to sleep in the same tent with you or <laughs> hey, let's go as light as we can. That's kind of their choice. Um, but yeah, most hunts, I would say they take a tent for each person. Um, but a lot of the time don't carry two tents. They'll uh, you know, leave one at the strip or ridge or whatever where I drop them off and 
and take one with them. Um, and, you know, some of the places, you guys are just day hunting. You know, if I land right on top and you're crossing legal rams from your tent in the morning, you're not taking a camp with you. You're just, just going light and day hunting and coming back. And then each guy's got his own tent at night. And it's definitely nicer that way. For sure. But, um, uh, normally, just speaking in general terms, normally, how much ground are your hunters covering from, say, you brought up a good point of if they're just day hunting. I mean, is it pretty common to kind of have a, you know, the original campsite and then you kind of just day hunt the ridges off into different drainages and then come back to the original point? Is that pretty normal or is it real common to start at one point and end up, you know, X amount of miles over in a completely different area? It varies a lot on the capabilities of the hunter. Um, I and personally, unless I could see a legal camp, uh, ram from camp, um, I would always take my camp with me. Um, and my guides most of the time do that as well. And a lot of the time I, I'll pick you up in a completely different, different location than where I drop you off. Um, and that's more efficient in most, most cases, but but not always. It just kind of depends where you're going and, and what I see before the season scouting. For sure. Let's shift the uh, gears a little bit and talk about your brown bear hunts and talk about when, first of all, when do you do the brown bear hunts? Um, well, I typically start brown bear hunting in April, um, hunting when they're just first coming out of their dens they're a uh kind of a snowshoe type of hunt uh fly and find dens or find tracks and and um, a lot of the bears we kill are on moose kills most of the big bears when they come out of their den they'll first thing they do is go kill a moose and then they'll just camp on that moose for sometimes weeks um so we start Start then in April, um, do a few spot and stock hunts, but the last three years ago, they legalized baiting brown bears. Um, and I started doing that and didn't think there was going to be a very high demand for it. But the last couple of years, nine out of 10 people that call, that's, that's what they want to do. I kind of appeal to bow hunters. I would say more than rifle hunters just because I, I travel and I bow hunt a lot. Um, and I, I, that just kind of is where my business has been headed the last couple of years is mostly baited, baited brown bear hunts. Um, tell me about those, um, baited brown bear hunts. So are they run out of a camp? Um, how, how does that work? Um, well, <laughs> it's, for me personally, as an outfitter, it's the hardest way you could ever hunt brown bears because I fly and pack meat all day, every day for two solid months. Um, we're on a bunch of baits and typically at each bait, they're all flying and the closest bait is a hundred miles from my house. Um, so I got to get up and fly all day, but I would typically have a spot that I land where I can walk in the bait and then a spot that I land where I will set up a camp. And a lot of the time it's across the river or a couple miles away, a mile away. Um, just somewhere where it's not affecting the bait. Um, and I run, run lots of trail cameras. Um, just not s fancy camps, but comfortable cots, 10 by 10 you know, tents that you can stand up in. Um, and kind of cater it towards towards bow hunters. But and how has the success been since you've been able to do bait? What'd you say three years ago? Um, you know, does everybody typically get a chance at a bear? You know, knock on wood, but I've never had a hunter yet on the baited hunt that hasn't had a 
Pope and Young Gromber standing there on the date in front of them. Um, I've had guys not kill bears for wounding them, missing them, uh, just being super picky. And some of the bears get rubbed, um, different things like that. So I've had some guys not not kill bears, but uh, everybody has had an opportunity, and that's that's probably the only it's probably the only brown bear hunt out there for a bow hunter that you could say that about. Um, and those uh, the baited brown bear hunts are they typically in the spring or are they also on the fall? I just do them in the spring, um, May and June. Okay. Okay, and um, in May and June, the weather pretty nice. It is. Yeah, it's warm. Um, it's light, pretty much twenty four hours a day. Um, I mean, we have days that are getting into the eighties, and nights are not freezing so you know 40 degree nights um but typically pretty nice weather now the concession or the areas that you hunt is it like open anybody can hunt these areas for doll sheep and for brown bear or are there areas that are specific to your outfit um part of the area that i sheep hunt in is specific to me um and I do sheep and grizzly bear hunts in there, and then some of it is open to basically anybody who's licensed for the area. Um, so it's kind of a combination of state and BLM hunt is mainly what I hunt on. Okay. And then the brown bear? Uh, the same. Same. But we're talking huge, huge tracts of land, right? I mean, just big, big country. Oh, yeah. Like yep, from from your it's, from uh, from your base camp, <laughs> like how far, like you could fly for how many hours and still be quote unquote in, in your area. <laughs> A long time. Um, like you'd run yeah. out of gas first. <laughs> <laughs> I could in my bear area. Uh, yeah. So oh, the the sheep from where I put the base camp, it's not too far. Most of it's within an hour flight um, in the Super Cub. But, uh, you know, the bear hunts start about an hour and 20, hour and 30 minutes from, from where we leave. Speaking, but, of, uh, speaking of running out of gas, have you ever run out of gas? This is, this is kind of off the grid question, but <laughs> have you ever run out of gas? Obviously with no one in the plane, but just you and yourself, have you ever ran out of gas in your plane and had to land? No. No. Have you ever come close? No, I'm a... <laughs> I... Come in on fumes? <laughs> yeah. yeah I've, I've been close a few times, but I... Never run out of gas. How many how many hours would you say you fly in a year all your trips and around? I mean, just tons and tons of hours? I fly about 400 hours a year. Wow. When, yeah. and, and typically the the May, June and the, you know, the the August time frames are those kind of the main during around the year? Uh, doll sheep and grizzly and then your brown bear hunts are those the main times that you fly yep I that's probably 300 350 of my 400 hours a year is typically for those hunts yeah and um, on the brown bear hunts you talk about carrying bait with you all around what do you what is legal to bait for brown bear what is legal bait uh, you basically just can't use fish or game parts. Um, I mainly just use dog food and grease and a, a good stink bait. Um, something to get their attention and brown bears just, they come to pack on calories. They don't, they're don't not really picky. care about eating sweet stuff. No, they just, they want to be able to come and eat you know, 50 or 100 pounds of food at one time, and and if they can't, then they're not interested. So uh, I go through a lot of dog food. 
The brown bear hunts. Um, so on bait, are you are your hunter your archery hunters up in a tree, or are they in a ground blind or brush blinds or what? Uh, ground blinds or tree stands. I typically start all the baits as tree stands. If for some reason we're getting pictures of big bears um, and guys aren't seeing them on stand, then I'll switch them to a ground blind. Uh, and it typically. Yeah, guys are getting smelled. Um, I do set up pretty much all my baits where I have some sort of a, oh, on the edge of a river or somewhere where the wind is going to be tunneled where bears can't circle and smell you. Uh, but it doesn't always work that way. And a ground blind, for the most part, eliminates that. Um, but it has its factors of its own pretty exciting if brown bear sticks his head in your blind yeah i was gonna say if you start scratching the blind i'm sure that can get your <laughs> blood boiling pretty good uh are you yep. a one question would be um do you guys shoot some pretty big brown bears on these hunts what are your, what's your normal size or kind of an average size of brown bear that you guys kill i tell guys we're looking for eight foot plus bears um we've killed some really big bears we killed one, oh, three years ago, I think. But, uh, it was the number one bear in the Pope and Young recording period. So out of anywhere in the state, it was the biggest bear killed in two years with a bow. Um, there there are some really big bears there. I don't, I'm not going to tell guys it's equivalent to Kodiak or the peninsula because it's not. But that being said, we've killed some bears that are as big as anything getting killed down there either um i want to ask you some questions about um your own personal hunting and your your uh, pursuit of the north american 29 so you've got 18 species under your belt um what do you have booked so to speak in the near future for you know say over the next year or next two um, in your pursuit of the 29? Um, this year I have a Tule elk hunt uh, and a woodland caribou hunt in Newfoundland. So with any any luck at all, I'll be at 20 this year. And um, my biggest problem that <laughs> personally is I hunt the same animals year after year. I hunt the same 10 or 12 species over and over and over again. And it's, I just have so much fun hunting everything that it's hard for me to just totally stay on a. <laughs> in, in, in other words, you, in other words, you have, you have hunts that you really like and you have animals that you really like, and that takes away time from trying to get the other uh, species that you need for the 29. My question would be, you know, you mentioned 10 animals that you like to hunt. You know, what's the handful of animals that you really, really like to hunt? Oh, I hunt coos deer every year. You do? Uh, I love hunting coos deer. Oh, yeah. In Arizona yeah. or uh, Mexico? I hunted Arizona and Mexico this year. You did? Um, I did, yeah. You? I didn't know that. So I'm from Arizona. I'm kind of a coos deer nut myself. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about it. You um, archery hunt in January and hunt them during the rut or what? Yep, yep. Um, I've been hunting Arizona since I was 19 years old. I've missed a couple of years, but um, I typically go down there. Before I was married, I'd spend the whole month of January down there. Uh, now I, I try to make it for a couple weeks. So you're a coos but, deer uh, nut, huh? I like hunting those little things. Yep. Yeah. What have you yeah. um, What have you found that you know? Why do you like them so much? I know why I do. I'm curious why you do. Oh, just got a lot of respect for them more than anything. Um, they're just a neat, neat animal, um, and it's a good time of year to be out of Alaska. For sure. The weather, the weather in January is spectacular and it's right during the middle yep. of the rut for coos deer. Have you been, so you've been hunting, you said since you're 19 years old, have you been fairly successful 
I mean, how many how many have you shot, uh, Jonah? I I've killed some nice bucks. Um, I'm trying to count. Handfuls, uh, handful handful of bucks. Killed killed about seven with a bow. Um, but I killed a couple good ones this year. Killed a buck in Arizona. Um, the gross is 117. Um, and I think he's going to net about 114. And I killed a buck in Mexico that's uh, 108 and some change this year. Nice. Tell me about uh, your, your favorite tactics. Um, are you spotting and stalking them, or are you you, you, you tree standing them, or are you sitting in water? What what do you like to do? Uh, hunt them about every way you can. Uh, I like calling them in. I really enjoy calling them in. The buck I killed in Mexico, I snuck into about 100 yards on him and just started grunting. Um, they're a really aggressive deer if you can get them worked up. And he, I, I was grunting at him, and he came out into about 18 yards, head sideways and ready to fight. Uh, so that's probably my favorite way to hunt them. Uh, most effective, I would say, is for a bow hunter anyways, is probably be sitting. Um, whether it's a water hole, scrape line, minerals, whatever. Uh, wherever you think you can kill a big buck. Do you, do you find, um, do you normally hunt southern Arizona or do you hunt central Arizona or have you hunted at all or what do you like? Uh, do you like one over the other? Mostly southern Arizona. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, it's just a those Sky Island mountain chains and and you know it's just a beautiful Southern Arizona is just if people haven't been there it's just a really neat place with the you know the grasslands and up into the oaks and the mesquite and the ocotillo I and mean, it's got such diverse terrain. Um, do you have any terrain that you specifically like to target for coos deer? Oh, I. <laughs> Not really any specific terrain. Um, seems like some of the bigger bucks we find are in thicker, thicker country that's a lot harder to hunt. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess a lot of my focus is, yeah, hunting hunting thick stuff that's not really glassable. Um, Tell me about the 117 it, buck this year. Well, it was the last 15 minutes of the last day, and I had to fly out the next morning because it was my three-year-old's third birthday. No way. <laughs> and it uh, had actually been, it was a really slow hunt this year, um, and I was sitting uh, sitting a rub line. It was actually a spot where two rub lines came together. I had seen a giant buck in there last year, uh, which is why I hung a stand in there, a big not the buck I killed, but an, another really big buck. Um, and I thought, well, it's the last night. That's as good a place to sit as any. And I heard a buck working the scrape right before dark and was standing there ready and he came walking through and I had a good shot on him. And, good for uh, you. Good for you. Yeah. I can't wait to see a picture of that buck. That's cool. Um, what is he? A three by three or? No, he actually almost looks like a mule deer. He's a four by four, um, and then eye guards. And he actually had a crown point coming off his front fork, but he busted it off when he rolled down the hill. Oh man! Um, so he might have tipped. It, he might have tipped one twenty with that point. Yeah, he's. Well, I know I remember seeing it when he came walking in. So it was long, looked like your finger. So it was, yeah, it, it, uh, it was busted off on the base. It was about an inch and three quarters across. So it was significant enough. That's really cool. That's but, that's uh, cool that we have a cooster in common. What are some other animals that you would say you just it's it's getting in the way of you chasing the twenty nine because you like so like to hunt so much. <laughs> I would say that uh, my favorite animal to hunt would be doll sheep. Uh, I love, I mean, that's what I live for. I always, always have. Um, most exciting animal to hunt would be a brown bear, a grizzly bear, especially bow hunting. 
there's nothing more exciting than than being right on a something that can eat you. And the most enjoyable is uh, doing bull elk. That's pretty hard to get away from. I got three elk hunts this year, so you do. I'd say that's probably getting in the way. Yeah. What states? I drew uh, Wyoming Unit Seven. Uh, I got the Thule elk hunt, and then I should uh, draw Unit Forty, Colorado. No way! You're going to be a busy dude. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. So elk, it is. elk and coos deer and doll sheep, uh, brown bear and grizzly bear, are kind of your staples. Yeah, I go to Kodiak and hunt black tails every year. Um, most years I have a mule deer tag somewhere. Um, I always shoot a handful of caribou in Alaska every year. So I goats. Uh, what do you think the hard, toughest hard animal to for in Alaska? Yeah, I'm sure. What do you think the toughest animal or the toughest couple of animals for you to 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 complete your 29 are going to be? Probably the sheep. Yeah. Um, have you drawn any sheep tags, you know, other than hunting doll sheep? Have you have you hunted stone or desert or Rockies? I haven't. Um, I get max points in Montana. I've been applying there since I was about 14. Um, I get points in every, every other sheep state, starting from when I was about 20. Um, haven't got lucky yet, but hopefully I'll draw something for sure um have you been on any desert yeah, sheep hunts actually gone just gone with buddies or anything i never have i've, I've been calling around i would like to find, a, find somebody over there to let me tag on tag along but i never have what about mule deer um you, you say you like to hunt mule deer um have you had some success hunting mule deer with a bow? Uh, I've killed a bunch of them. No great big ones. It's a tough, the early high country hunts, it's tough for me to get any time to leave Alaska. I've never actually got to go bow hunt them when it's a good time of year for it. Um, shot some nice bucks with the bow. I've, I've killed some pretty good bucks with a rifle, um, more or less just because that's a time of, you know, November, I can get away in November. Um, were you able, when you were, yeah. um, when you were in Gunnison, were you able to, uh, I wonder what years you were there, were you able to see some of that Gunnison Basin before that 2007 winter kill and see how many unbelievable deer there were around there? Well, I don't have a whole lot of regrets in my life, but that uh, that's one of them. Uh, yeah, I was there and it was, prime um i helped some guys kill some amazing bucks i was with rick french when he killed his 215 inch deer right i've had Another rick on the podcast killed... rick's a great guy he is he's a good friend of mine yeah yeah I, I had him on the podcast uh he, he's a good dude he had an elk hunt here in arizona years ago and and um uh kind of talked with them back and forth and shared a few, little bit of information and such and um, kind of been uh, catch up with them, say, once a year since then. And, and um, he's a really good guy. Yeah, so you you helped him yeah. kill a big buck in Colorado? Yeah, I was done enough to him when he shot his 215-inch deer. Um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I lived in Gunnison during the glory days and never had a milder tag there. Oh man! During those years, just uh, you know, I was young. I was eighteen, nineteen years old. And, sure. And sure. Hindsight's twenty twenty. What was the, um? So you're so you you'll probably hit twenty out of the twenty nine, and so you have nine left, and obviously you'll be subject to drawing the sheep tags and such. Um. Other than the sheep tags, are you going to try and pluck off the, you know, say the remaining six, um, you know, over the next couple of years, or are you just going to let it unfold as it, as it may? 
Um, yeah, I'm going to keep plugging away for sure. Um, I'm always looking at hunts and talking to, talking to outfitters and talking to people. Um, I, I don't have anything completely booked yet, but, uh, I'll definitely be plugging away and at least trying to hunt one new species a year. Cool. Cool. Well, I can't wait to watch, uh, your, unvin- your adventure unfold. And, um, it's been great having you on the podcast. Uh, I'm going to give you a chance to let, uh, the listeners know how they can get a hold of you. I highly recommend they go on your website or on your, um, your website, but also on your Facebook page, um, Jonah's Alaskan Outfitters on uh, Facebook, and uh, you've got a really cool page, a lot of cool pictures. But but why don't hey, you tell the you, listeners hey. tell the listeners how they can reach you and uh, if they want to talk with you more? Yeah, uh, well, my website is Jonah's Alaskan Outfitters dot com. Um, my email is Jonah's Alaskan Alaskan Outfitters at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook uh, under Jonah Stewart as my personal and under Jonah's Alaskan Outfitters on Facebook. And then uh, my phone number is 907-841-4560. I like talking to hunters and and uh, especially talking with bow hunters whether you want to come hunting with me or just uh, advice on booking a hunt or what not they that's all i think about <laughs> man some of these i'm looking at some of these um brown bear pictures on your uh facebook page they're unbelievable photos some of <laughs> these trail cams are so cool it's yeah, kind of rare i don't see i don't see a lot of brown bear um photos like this yeah, well, it's pretty new. Uh, I mean, I've guided and hunted Kodiak and the peninsula and South Central, Southeast Alaska, the Beach Range, and I've hunted birds all over the whole state. Um, and the baiting is pretty new, but it, it does work. Um, it's a great way for a bow hunter to, to kill a brown bear, and uh, people like doing it, so... Awesome. I've been hitting it hard the last few years, and it works. Well, it's been great having you on. I look forward to meeting you in person someday. And uh, yeah, a fellow coos deer nut, uh, pretty awesome. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm actually fortunate. Uh, I drew a, a, I had Frank Sanders um, on the podcast earlier this year, and uh, my my hunting partner and I actually drew uh, mountain goats with Frank Sanders. Uh, here this August coming up, so we're stoked to go up there. And um, then I, I've got a Northwest Territories, my first doll sheep hunt uh, in 18 with Arctic Red River. And so I've, I've been bitten by the doll sheep bug, never even seen a doll sheep ever. Um, but I'm trying to learn everything <laughs> I can about them. And um, Alaska is certainly on my radar to to come, I know after I go on my first doll sheep hunt, I know it's going to be one of those things, kind of like you with coos deer, where you just got to go every year. Um, oh yeah. So it's uh, it's been awesome having you on, and I I wish you the best of success, and I'll be watching your um, successes on Facebook, and um, yeah, like I said, I look forward to meeting you in person someday, and just really appreciate you uh, spending time here with us. Yeah, likewise, Jay. I appreciate the call and it's good talking with you all right buddy sounds good take care and god bless okay all right you too thanks jay all right bye